All right, here we, here we go. So if you have your Bible, we're looking at Ezekiel. I've been preaching from Ezekiel lately. And uh, I've been reading from Ezekiel. Boy, oh boy. You better be living right when you crack open that book. <laughs> You're going to be starved with conviction. Man, anybody that sees God and cherubs and angels and all this kind of stuff, I and mean, he's in touch with something, yeah. amen, that's uh, powerful, potent stuff. But Ezekiel, the 28th chapter, beginning at verse 11, and I want to read down to verse 19. It's going to be kind of a lengthy thing here. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say to him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sun, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Wait, wait a minute, I thought we were talking about a king here. Mm. King of Tyre. Tyre was a real place, a real city. It had a real king. But all of a sudden, I'm hearing something here. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and the gold and the workmanship of thy tablets and thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day thou was created. Right. Thou art the anointed cherub that covered. Yeah. I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. Mm -hmm. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou, was corrupted. thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth the fire from the midst of thee, and it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all of them that behold thee. And all they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee, and thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. <laughs> This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray right now. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the word of God that you've spoken by your prophet Ezekiel, O Lord. And we know, God, that you had something in mind. You are sharing with us heavenly mysteries and deep spiritual things. We come to you tonight, Lord God, because we want to understand how we can avoid the sin and the traps of sin, Lord God, that are in this world that have been brought to us by this being. In Jesus' name, we give you praise. Amen and amen. 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 amen and amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. I want to I want to talk to you tonight about resident evil. Resident evil. Now, there's an alternate reading from the New Living Translation, which I want to share with you. That same passage of Scripture. <clears throat> So pardon me the length for this introduction, but I think this will help you understand even better. Then this further message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, weep for the king of Tyre. Give him this message from the sovereign Lord. You were the perfection of wisdom and beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Your clothing was abandoned uh, or adorned. Your clothing was adorned with every precious stone, red Carnelian, chrysolite, white moonstone, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald, all beautifully crafted for you and set in the finest gold. They were given to you on the day you were created. I ordained and anointed you as the mighty angelic guardian. You had access to the holy mountain of God and walked among the stones of fire. You were blameless in all that you did from the day you were created until the day evil was found in you. Your great wealth filled you with violence, and you sinned. So I banished you from the mountain of God. I expelled you, O mighty guardian, from your place among the stones of fire. Your heart was filled with pride because of all your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth and exposed you to the curious gaze of kings. You defiled your sanctuaries with your many sins and your dishonest trade. So I brought fire from within you and it consumed you. I let it burn you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all that were watching. All who knew you were appalled at your fate. 
You have come to a terrible end, and you are no more. What we are reading here, what we're seeing in this text of Scripture, is a strange thing. Because it addresses a man, but then it goes into a description of that which could only be Lucifer himself. And so, throughout the weaving of this prophecy, we are going back and forth between things and conditions and spiritual aptitudes that are prevalent, not only on this earth, but coming from a source which has fallen from the grace of God. So we're seeing this interplay. What it is, is an amalgam, an amalgamation of a man with a spirit that is behind the man. Now we've talked about this in Sunday's message. I talked about Ezekiel being a graphic voice in prophecy. When you read Ezekiel, every chapter is a picture. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thousand words in a picture. It describes picturesque things. It paints a picture for you. Before we launch into our uh, dissertation tonight, there are two scriptures that you need to keep in mind and bear in mind and let them resonate in the back of your mind as I talk to you about these things. The first is found in 1 Samuel 15, 23a, which says, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. And then Proverbs 16, 18 through 19 tells us, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better it is to be of an humble spirit with the lowly than, than to divide the spoil with the proud. These two scriptures are foundational principles and truth that back up God's condemnation of this king of Tyre, and it is more than a man that he is talking to and about. Tyre was a real city, it was a real place, had real kings. We'll talk about one of them in a moment. But to understand our text, we must incorporate these spiritual definitions into the midst. But why the king of Tyre? This scripture is one of two which give us a portrait of Satan and the reasons why he fell from heaven. The other one is found in the book of Isaiah, chapter 14, verses 12 through 17. We call this the five I wills of Satan. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. And they that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble and that did shake kingdoms? That made the world as a wilderness and destroyest the cities thereof? That made the world as a wilderness and destroys the cities thereof, and open not the house of his prisoners. The five I wills of Satan. We know that Satan has a destination. God says his destination is hell. And that God has prepared a place for Satan and his angels and all those that, uh, that die in sin and die in iniquity. Those who have chosen to follow the same path in the same route to spiritual destruction that these spiritual entities did. Pride, rebellion, haughtiness of heart and spirit, and wanting to be like God. So we see here how pride caused Lucifer's fall. But in Ezekiel, we see why that pride caused Lucifer's fall. And it was in the manner in which he was created. God poured all the excellence of his creative imagery into this one being. And, and God created everything. All the universes, all the stars, all the planets, 
solar systems, all the angels, and all the animals, all life, all life, and mankind. And he created man in a form lower than the angels. So this being was created, and he's higher than the he's higher than the angels. He is the anointed cherub that covereth. He is the chief guardian angel. God made him, poured everything of divine creativity into this angelic being Lucifer that he could. And that being was to stand over the throne of God or to be over the throne of God and to represent the glory of God, the majesty of God, the creative ability of God. All that springs, all that came forth came from God. This was the apex of God's creation, this angelic being. He was so perfect that it went to his head. He was so beautiful that he became the ultimate narcissist. He had so much wealth poured into him, so much splendor poured into him, that he became the very heart of covetousness and materialism. And he exhibited, he, he exampled to us what a haughty spirit and what a prideful mind combined with rebellion and stubbornness can do. He just demonstrated that. And it is why he fell why he is has fallen so I, I i i want you to understand the connection here and i'm, I'm going to dig a little bit deeper into tyrus into tire and all this but before i do i want you to see and understand that there is a spiritual physical connection between our world our presence and the spirits that are around us every one of us comes into this world and we have sort of inherited guardian angels especially those who shall be heirs of salvation god acts the church daily such as should be saved he knows in advance who will be saved and there have been guardian angels in those persons lives from the moment they were born unknown to them and unseen to them but they knew the future, they knew the destiny, and they were there to protect and help and guide along the way. And uh, those same people may have followed many paths, divergent paths in their search ultimately for spiritual truth and for God. But all those paths led them to a point and to a place where they could confess and recognize God and confess Him and, and, and come to Him and repent of their sins. It's all part of this yeah. great majestical plan. The, the plan of God's majesty. But on the other hand, those that are destined for destruction, those that are destined, they will never be saved. God knows they will never be saved. There are spirits also that are at loose and at work with them. And it's that same spirit that was cast out of heaven and came down to this earth and began to interfere with God's creative plan and purpose. And uh, this spirit has risen many, many times over. So, what is it about the Jews that the world hates so much? We're just learning. I'm just learning that uh, uh, the, uh, what do you call them, the four in Congress? What's the, the squad? The Democrats are in control of our government completely. And this squad of liberal young female Democrats in Congress are proposing to drop from the defense budget the million dollars a year that have been set aside to help supply Israel with the uh, Iron Dome system. 4,600 rockets were fired last spring into Israel and that depleted their arsenal of of defensive missiles. We're talking about this is a defensive system. It has no attack capabilities at all. It is all about saving lives of people in Israel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there is a hatred and anti-Semitism right. that has prevailed from the beginning of God establishing this race of people. Come the on. devil hates pe the people of God. Right. He hates the woman that brought forth 
the man child, yeah. and he will pour forth his vengeance upon her and drive her into the desert. But God will send wings of angels, wings of eagles to lift her up and to hide her in a safe place away and save the remnant and save people. What is it about Jews that the world hates them so much? What is it about Christians that the world hates so much? The chief target of Islamic jihadists is Christians, Jews, and Hindus. And in a in a terror attack that took place some time ago, uh, the the organizers, the planners of the event, speaking to the terrorists that were carrying it out, told them, make sure you get Jews, because one Jew is worth 50 other people. What is it about Jews? Satan hates. We're talking about resident evil. We saw it rise some 80 years ago or so. Uh, when uh, uh, Nazi, when Hitler seized control of Germany and the Nazi party formula began to go forth, within just a few months' time, he had conquered, pretty much, he had conquered Europe. He had conquered Western Europe. The democracies fell. They fell. Amen. Holland fell in five days. Belgium fell in 12 hours. Denmark fell. Uh, uh, overnight, and France fell in six weeks. In six weeks, the British expeditionary force that had been sent to help defend Europe and Poland was driven to the coast to a town called Dunkirk and surrounded by Hitler's tanks, which were now in view of the sea. His bombers, his Stuka bombers, his tanks, everything was ready, but, but something stopped. Hitler stopped. He stopped the attack. His generals wanted to finish them off, but Hitler stopped. He stopped. This is called the miracle of Dunkirk. We couldn't understand why he didn't go ahead and give the order, but God gave time, amen, for, uh, for a, uh, an armada of boats. Any, anything from a speedboat to a destroyer or to a freighter could come, amen. And 328,000 British expeditionary forces were saved and lifted and brought back to England. It was that time period that Chamberlain's government fell. The disaster of Dunkirk caused the fall of Chamber Chamberlain's government. And suddenly the man that had been the pariah that I mentioned on Sunday, Winston Churchill, that had been the pariah, the war hawk, was now brought in to power. The better notters had had their day. But it was seen that the only thing that stood between tyrannical totalitarian rule that would take over the world was a tiny island nation without the sufficient tanks, without the sufficient men, sufficient airplanes, and sufficient firepower to stop Hitler. Churchill was desperate for the United States to help. He kept, he kept trying to appeal to Franklin Roosevelt, who was on his side, who understood the consequences, but because of World War I, our nation was so entrenched in isolationism that no one wanted to go back to Europe to fight another war. It was a strong movement in this country not to help out. That thin line that separated us from facing off against all of the array that Hitler could have brought against us if England fell when it fell. They were only months away from an invasion by sea. Operation Sea Lion, Germany, Operation Sea Lion was preparing barges and boats to, and they were gonna airlift and they were gonna come across the 20 miles of the channel and they were gonna invade an England who could not have fought them off. Thus began the Battle of Britain, the bombing raids that tried to wipe out the Air Force. Less than a thousand planes, less than a thousand planes were able to stop wave after wave after wave of bombers. Of Messerschmitt 109s and 110s and Dornier bombers and Henkel bombers were able to stop the, and, and Hitler gave the stop go, the stop order. We're not going to go and, and we're not going to invade. And that gave Britain time and it gave the United States time and God worked it out. Amen. And war was declared. And though it was a terrible thing 
That's World War II. It was a terrible thing. It was necessary. It was necessary to stop something that was already happening in Germany, which was the destruction of the, uh, of the weak-minded uh, and, and the development of the super race and, and Hitler uh, devising plans to, uh, to create supermen and they would breed with women to have a super race of people and the inferior child child's head skulls had to be measured their eyes color had to be examined their hair color had to be examined everything had to be just so or that child was considered inferior racially inferior and and, and worth nothing going to put to work make slaves live going to get rid of them and so ultimately <clears throat> that practice was carried out on jews on gypsies on jehovah witnesses on anybody who opposed Hitler, and we know uh, the terrible death that, that went on. Uh, about 11 or 12 million people died in concentration camps, of which about 6 million were Jews. Almost the entire population of Jewish Europe was wiped out. But what came out of it was a miracle. One that the Bible had prophesied, one that prophets had foretold hundreds, thousands and thousands of years ago. Yeah. The rebirth yeah. of the land yeah. and the nation of yeah. Israel. Thank you, Lord. What I'm telling you is that there is an association with spiritual uh, devices and entities along with human minds and human governments. And there are paths by which these spirits connect themselves and attach themselves to people. And what I've read to you uh, uh, from the Bible's description of Lucifer should begin to enlighten us and show us some of the paths that are taken for people to fall away from God. I think we ought to give God a hand praise right now. Thank you. <laughs> Just as Old Testament, the Old Testament contained types and shadows of New Testament worship and salvation, which is the true spiritual religion, so does it also show types of resident evil. Daniel spoke of it in Daniel 11, 36 to 39. The king shall do according to his will. He will exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. Shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that which is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the god of his fathers nor the desire of women nor regard any god for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the god of forces and a God whom his fathers do not shall they honor with gold, with silver, with precious stones, and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, who he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for gain. We see this man spoken of, that Daniel spoke of, the book of Revelation Describes this man as the Antichrist, as the beast, as a, as a man whom Satan manifests himself in and through. Indeed, it is revealed that the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Hide us, saying, hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. Revelation 6, 15 through 17. We see that there is a judgment now coming against something, a spirit of something that has gotten a hold of men. Notice where it starts. The kings of the earth, the great men, the mighty men, the chief captains. And then every bondman and every free man are going to be also joined in. But where is the judgment falling first? Where does it come first? It comes from the mighty. It comes from the strong, it comes from the wealthy, it comes from the captains of industry and, and military and government and so forth and so on. It comes against this type of people. The 18th chapter of the book of Revelation deals with God's judgment on, on, uh, on commerce and on wealth. Revelations 18. After these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the greatest fallen, it's fallen. It's become the habitation of devils, the whole of every foul spirit in a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. 
For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached into heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to the works in the cup which she hath filled, filled to her double. How much she hath glorified herself and lived this deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her, for she saith in her heart, I sit a queen. I am no widow. I shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day. Death, mourning, famine. She shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. The kings of the earth who have committed fornication and live deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament her, for they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come, and the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, and no man buyeth her merchandise anymore. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and of fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and fine thyan wood and all manner of vessels of ivory and all manner of vessels of the most precious wood and of brass and of iron and of marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and the souls of men. And the fruits of thy soul lusted at, the fruits of thy soul lusted after are departed from thee. All things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt not, thou shalt find them no more. The merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour so great riches has come to naught, and every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off. What we're seeing, what we're reading here in the book of Revelation is that final judgment on the commercial Babylon. The preceding chapter, chapter 17, is a judgment on the spiritual Babylon, the religious system of the world of its day. But this, this chapter deals with the commercial enterprise of the world. And so we know that we are living in a global age, in a global world, and we're mo moving toward a global economy. And uh, so much money is now being made and traded in something called cryptocurrency and bitcoins. And there's all kinds of variations of that uh, uh, out there. And it's all speculation, but God is fixing it. He's fixing it. He's getting it ready. He's getting us ready. This vaccine mandate, uh, this demand of the government that forces people to take an injection against their will if they want to work, if they want to eat, if they want to have a roof over their head. They have got to have a vaccination. This mandate of the government is nothing more, amen, than a, 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 a training experience to implement the mark of the beast. That's what it is. It is a setup. It's not the mark of the beast, but it is a setup for if we will submit to these kind of government mandates, Ultimately, they will say, when men cry, peace and safety, peace and safety, you need to do this for peace and safety. Then comes sudden destruction. This is all in the book. It's all in the book, my friend. We are, we are walking a fine line between now and eternity. We are walking a fine line between now and the rapture. Yes. And everything is coming together, church. Everything is coming together. Right. And the resident evil that is in place in our world, in place in government, our government and other governments, yes. is on the march and on the move toward this globalization and this hatred of Christians and hatred of, of the Jews, God's chosen people. And anyone that wants to live right and do right, there is a resident spirit of evil that wants to destroy and have its way. And it will get its chance. And it will have its day. But God will have the final word. Oh, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So let's go back and see why God linked the king of Tyre with Lucifer. Tyre, as a city, was on an island uh, off the 
uh, shore of the Mediterranean Sea, which would have been the, the western shore of the Mediterranean Sea. I'm sorry, the eastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea. There's no western shore. There's only not north, east, and south. And it was on an island out in the sea where it could uh, be safe from attack, supposedly. It was a colony of the of, of the Phoenicians. Who were the Phoenicians? They are, are, they're called the Sea Peoples. Uh, and another term for them is the Philistines. They were the Philistines. And uh, Canaan, to a large part, was settled, colonized, and influenced by this culture before and between the time that Abraham walked the land that God promised to him and his descendants and the time when the Hebrews finally came into Canaan to conquer it. So they were well settled in that area. But their main cities were on the coast. On the coastline, there were some five or six of these cities that were up and down the coastline, and so they were perfect trading routes for ships that could come all the way from, from Europe, from Greece, the Grecian Isles, from Europe, from the Black Sea and Russia, all the way down the coast to Egypt, and on to North Africa, and on to Greece, and on to Rome. That isn't the only way that that trade route went. The entire circumference of the Mediterranean coastline and the regions inland from there were open to trade. But not only that, the trade came from the far east through, uh, through Iran, up the Euphrates River Valley, and then over across through Turkey and down through where? Down through Palestine, down through Canaan, down through what would become Israel. And it would proceed down along the coast through the Gaza Peninsula and on to Egypt and down through uh, the Gulf of Aqaba, which would now allow them to go through the Red Sea and reach the northeastern and the eastern sides of Africa. It was a tremendous, tremendous movement of trade that was constantly moving through the area. And so much of it was carried by by sea, the fastest way to move anything was ships at sea. And uh, then there were uh, the, the, the caravans of camels that came across the desert. That was slow, but they went on. They went on for miles and miles and miles and for thousands and thousands of years, constantly trekking across the waste places from the Far East to the Middle East to the Near East to Egypt and so, so on and so forth. And it all had to have a nexus. It all had to come somewhere. And in our world, there is one place where it seems that the wealth of the world is centered in our world. Amen. That is in New York City, and that is on Wall Street. And we control so much of the trade of the world, and so much of the product of the world, and so much of the wealth of the world is here in this country and flows between us and other nations and other lands. So if you can put that uh, image in your mind of modern trade and commerce, you can begin to see how wealthy Tyre was. It was the most important seaport for the nexus of all of these trade routes. Everything that came in by sea in ships came to the port of Tyre and was exported out inland. Everything that came from the Far East wound up in the port of Tyre to be loaded on ships and exported out there. So you can imagine that they were very wealthy and well-to-do. They came to prominence, they, the city rose to prominence on two products of which were native to them, the cedars of Lebanon, highly sought after for building projects, and a dye, a purple dye, that was only manufactured there because it came from sea snails that were located in their area of the coast. And they took these cuttlefish, these sea snails, and they boiled them and they got this purple dye, which because it was hard to produce and the, the supply of snails was limited, uh, uh, it was very costly. Thus, royal purple became the garment of choice for the wealthy because it was the most valuable dye that was being produced. So they rose to prominence on trading on these things, 
and developed a trade nexus, a seaport that everything flowed into it. So when God says, I have something against you, King of Tyre, I'm speaking to you, King of Tyre. He is talking about a man or kings of that city. He is talking about a city. He's talking about a real place with real people. But now the amalgamation, the amalgam, the overlapping of something else, a spirit that is in it and behind it. The spirit of covetousness, of materialism, of wealth, and the pursuit of wealth, and the comforts and the pleasures that come out of it, is what's being talked about here, and why God is condemning it. Of all the cities that settled, thus settled on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, Tyre and Sidon became the leading centers of trade and commerce. But long before this, God had people. He had a man, Abraham, who had no permanent dwelling place, who lived in a tent, who lived the life of a nomad. He didn't have a mansion, but he was looking for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker was God. He didn't settle for any of that thing, but yet God blessed him. God Kept him simple, but God profoundly blessed him. He was blessed and wealthy in, in livestock and cattle and donkeys and sheep and in goats. And the Bible says in gold and silver and in the souls of men. He was one of the wealthiest men of his time and day. But he was a nomad. Hallelujah. Now, I don't have anything against people being wealthy or getting rich. But the Bible is very clear about the spirit of wealth and what it can do to your mind, to your heart, to your spirit, and to your soul. And as long as you can stay simple, God can trust you. But wealth has a way of corrupting people. It has a way. Job was a godly man. He possessed great wealth until it was taken away by Satan. But wealth wasn't what Job was after. He was after God. And God blessed him with great wealth. And when it was taken away all in one day, he said, God gave it. God can take it back. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Yeah. He was after God, not wealth. Amen. And But God gave him the blessings of the Lord. Yeah. Only only those kind of people can God really trust with these kinds of things. By and large, the Hebrews went from a nomadic existence when they conquered Canaan to simple farming and livestock. They lived in villages, very simple huts, houses, three-room houses, made of stone and uh, dirt floors. They farmed, they had livestock. They could produce most everything that they needed to get by. They needed uh, a cooking vessel, they'd make a pot, put it in the oven, fire it up, temper it, and they'd have a pot. Somebody got real good at it, and they just started making a lot of pots, and everybody said, well, I'll, I'll give you a hen of barley for one of your pots. Uh, somebody else got really good at livestock and raising sheep, and the farmer who was doing really good on olives says, well, I'll, I'll give you a bushel of olives for a sheep. And trade started. But there were certain things that they couldn't do for themselves. They couldn't do metal work and other things. And they had to go get that from somewhere else. And so uh, initially, all trade was just a simple barter system. It was a simple barter system. And in time, it got difficult to carry things to a market. I got all these sheep, and I got to go trade them for all this, stuff, and I got to get all this stuff home, and blah, 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 blah. And eventually, people figured out that we could equivalent the value of our products in terms of precious metals, and we could assign a value to it. And so, thus, they would begin a system of trade, and trades, and balances, and scales, and weights, and balances. And now everybody had to come to the market with their own set of weights and balances because you didn't trust the merchant set. You wanted to verify by your set. 
And then you would negotiate back and forth between them on a fair price of it all. It was complicated until they learned to stamp coins. And then things begin to go from there. So this simple need to get things from things, from where, this, I mean, this, and that, it developed into a great global commercial trading system that at the root of it, and you know this is true, all wealth comes from trade. We go to work to get money. We produce products to get money so we can buy stuff. When we go to the store, we buy stuff, and then we give them money, and they make profit and put the money in the bank, and they buy more stuff. And then we go buy more stuff. Then we take our old stuff and we put it out for a garage sale and nobody buys it. And then we leave it in a box at the curb and put free on it. And they still won't take it. <laughs> Canaan or Palestine was set squarely apart the major trade route intersection of all the known world. All the products of merchantmen by sea, Canaan being Phoenician, Canaan being the Phoenician word for merchant, came uh, through these port centers. The entire group to be uh, most important and wealthy because of the trade in cedar and in dyes. And the, so I talked about that already. So, Enriched by their products, they became the hub, hub of trade that reached into Europe, to the Far East, to Egypt, Arabia, Africa, and all manner of products flowed into and out of Tyre. And in the process, the city became very wealthy. They became very sophisticated. They became very polished. They had their trades to the perfection. I mean, the perfection of the skill and the trade that they could command with that money. Because money can buy the best. And if you got money, you want the best. Who will settle for less when you can have the best? Y'all get flat on me. I'm fixing to drop a boom. You feel like we could. All right. Hallelujah. True. So, and the prophets viewed this situation with strong disapproval. Prosperity bred pride, corruption, dead and slavery. And there was more for the rich, but less and less for the poor. And what was worse, imports included not only the material goods, but also foreign religions. That's from the Lion Encyclopedia of the Bible. So we can see why the prophets and why God had an issue with all of this. The accumulation of wealth in the hands of a few, them abusing their wealth and power, the many struggling and without and worst of all, the religion, foreign religions. Yes. King David did business with Tyre. He did business with King Hiram of Tyre, who sold David the cedar wood for his palace, and also for King Solomon's palace, and for the temple of God. All that cedar came from Tyre, from Hiram of Tyre. So wealthy was Tyre that they could afford the finest and the most skilled craftsmen to create magnificent projects. And one such was a man born of a Jewish mother and a man from Tyre who became the chief architect and engineer for Solomon's palace and for the temple. Those bronze pillars on the porch of Solomon that were 27 foot high, not counting the capitals on top of them, were made cast of pure bronze by King Hiram of Tyre. And they were big, so big you couldn't put your arm around them. They were hollow. And the walls of, the, of that casting was three inches thick. Can you imagine the technical skill required well before the time of Christ to create such a project as that? But not only did, he, not only did Tyre produce that, but all of the bronze furnishings, the sea, the bronze labor, the bronze sea, it was... 15 feet in diameter, and it's set on the back of 12 bronze oxen. Three to the north, three to the east, three to the south, three to the west, set on the back. It was a swimming pool, cast bronze, made by the technical skill of the artificers of King Hiram of Tyre. The best of the best. 
the best that wealth could do would flow into Jerusalem and flowed into that city. And how did it come to be? It came to be because David, Solomon's father, had fought the wars that, that settled peace and created dominion over that territory that allowed Israel to be the dominant kingdom at the very nexus of all the trade centers of the world with a friend and ally, Tyre, that port city to the outside world, just to the north of them as a friend and an ally. And they were doing business together. And David and, uh, and uh, King Hiram Tyre had a navy of ships that, David had ships that sailed. And Solomon had ships that sailed and went as far as Africa uh, to, for, to the gold fields of Ophir. And, and so the, the wealth and the magnificent, and God said, I'm going to make you the, the, the wisest man, but I'm also going to make you the wealthiest man. And he was the wealthiest. It was the golden era of Israel. And the wealth of the world flowed through the territory of Israel, and every bit of it got taxed. To pass through, it got taxed. And the coffers built up and built up and built up. It was a tremendous system there that came about. It came about. Wealth makes people crazy. What lengths some will go to so they can have something better than somebody else. The pride, the sin, the corruption, the power seeking, the spiritual apathy that comes with wealth is anything but an avenue to God. Those with great wealth shut themselves away behind gated communities. They resort to certain zip codes. Anybody know any of these zip codes? You're going to give yourself away. You're going to give yourself away. <laughs> Amen. Uh, uh, they resort to certain zip codes. They resort to certain communities in certain areas where there's just nothing but mansion after mansion and there's no low-income housing anywhere in here. No, no house like you or I. You wouldn't find a trailer anywhere near it. They join clubs that common folks cannot get into and they do everything to elevate their status above other people. Are you a status symbol seeker? Do you have to have this particular brand because of its status? Do you have to drive a certain vehicle because of its status? Do you have to have a certain thing because of its status and because of the image that it promotes and gives you when people see you with this status? All of this is for pride and rebellion against God's way. It's for haughtiness, it's for stubbornness, and it's for iniquity. So we see the amalgam there. We see now why God has something against the king of Tyre, but really what he's talking about is the spirit behind it all. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God, where all this started was, all the wealth that ever was. Amen. I created Lucifer as the epitome and the expression of all the wealth, of all the splendor, of all the beauty, of all the technology, of all the glory. And what did he do with it? It went to his head. And it's what happens to people who fall into this trap of status and of wealth and of money. Jesus said it in Mark 10, 23 through 25, that if it was harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God than for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. Paul told us in 1 Timothy 6, 9 and 10, But they which shall be rich fall into temptations and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which the while some covet after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Verses 17 through 19 says, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trusted in certain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Yeah. Thank you. Money got Simon, the converted sorcerer, in trouble. When he thought that he could buy the power of laying on of hands for the Holy Ghost. 
Peter said, thy money perish with thee. Money got Ananias in trouble and Sapphira in trouble with God. And they lost their life because they wanted to defraud God. In the end, Demas forsook God for this present world. Money and the things that it can buy will get you in trouble. Judas, Judas a disciple, sold Jesus for a mere 30 pieces of silver for his own personal use. And in that moment in time, for the first time Satan was kicked out of heaven, Lucifer and God were face to face. Well, what do you mean, Pastor? At the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, when Jesus indicated who it was that was going to betray him, and he said to Jesus, what thou doest, do it quickly. The Bible says, at that moment, Satan entered him. And what was in Jesus was God, the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in Jesus bodily. Yeah. And at that moment, Lucifer kissed the face of God. The closest they have ever been since the fall. All the 30 pieces. Remember Jezebel? Who is she? King Ahab's wife. Who was she? She was the daughter of King Ethbaal, who was the king of Tyre and Sidon. And when Ahab married the daughter of the king of Tyre, she brought with her 850 priests and caused her husband to erect a temple in his capital city of Samaria to the worship of her gods, Baal and Ashtar. That importation of wealth, of importance, of status, and of false religion, that spirit, that resident evil that comes out of that system is to be avoided at all costs. It is to be avoided at all costs. There are resident evils in systems and governments and administrations and in men and women who vault themselves up and lift themselves up above God. You understand I'm closing, but there's a reason. There's a reason, Paul says, that there are not many, there are not many noble, there are not many mighty, there are not many wealthy in the church. There's a reason for that. In the goodness of God, we need to learn how to be abased and how to abound. To serve in sickness and in health, and in wealth and in poverty, and when we have much or when we have little, nothing to stand between us and God. How tight. Amen. Many people can't handle it because they... they they can't handle wealth because they become confused about who they really are on the inside. Become confused. You come into some money suddenly and boy, does it ever change. I've seen it happen in some of our church people. I'm not going to tell you the particulars of the stories, but I could tell, if I was preaching out, I'd tell it, I'd tell it, but I can't tell it now because you know what I'm talking about. But I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen. How tight is your grip on God? It better be tight, tighter than your grip on your wallet or yes. your pocketbook or it's your checkbook. True. And if you're defrauding God, and if you are blessed and are wealthy, and you're not willing to distribute and communicate and be and do good and be rich in good works, and you're withholding time, you're withholding from God, you're yes. not giving credit to God. Something wrong there. Something wrong there. Money and the love of money is the root of evil. It can get our heart. And we say, not me, not me. But God loves a cheerful giver. And yes. I want God to love. I want God's love. Thank you. Lord. God loves a cheerful giver, and I want God's love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now I've shown you the danger of desiring 
things for covetousness and for status. But I am not saying that it's sinful or wrong to have wealth and to be blessed. What I am saying is you can't let it change who you are. And I will share this with you. I knew a millionaire. But you never, you would never know he was a millionaire. He dressed just like you guys, you fellas up here. Just like you fellas. He was the only son and heir of the Carl Department Store fortune. He lived modestly. He dressed modestly. He spent sparingly. And there were several times when my wife and I were invited to dinner with him. We'd be in a restaurant and he would tell me things. He would say, my pastor uh, uh, is asking me for money. And he wants uh, $180,000 to buy this pipe organ and import it from Europe and then put it up in our church. And, 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 uh, and he wasn't very happy about being pressured for that kind of wealth and money for something like a stupid old European pipe organ. <laughs> what that church really needed was the Holy Ghost. Yes. Yeah. And then it wouldn't need a pipe organ because if the people get to shout and praise the Lord, you wouldn't hear a pipe organ. Right. Nothing to kill a service more than a pipe. <laughs> Give me a Hammond B3 any day. Let me rock on it. <laughs> Praise God. Well, oh, but then he'd say to me, Pastor, he said, do you need anything? More than once he'd say to me, Pastor, do you need anything? Do you need anything? I'm telling you, the average pastor would say, oh, yeah, brother, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Carl. You know, yes, Mr. Carl. I, I need this. I need that. I could use it. I need a catalog. <laughs> I need a timeshare. I need an RV. I do need all that stuff. I really do need all that stuff. Okay. <laughs> but I ain't got in 40 years. I don't expect I'm ever going to get it. No, I'm just kidding you. Praise the Lord. I've never been in it for the money. You know that. Yeah. And he said, Pastor, you need anything? And I said, no, we're okay. We're doing fine. I, and I always saw it as, as both an offer and a test. I always saw it as both an offer and a test. He was testing me because he was talking about what was going on that he didn't like in his church. Then he was going to turn around and ask me if I need anything. So I saw it as a test, but I also felt it was a legitimate offer. And if I'd expressed something, he would have helped me out. Well... I must have passed the test because the day came when I was up on that roof shingling by myself and Mr. Carl drives up and he gets out of the car and I said, oh, Mr. Carl, it's nice to see you. Let me come down. Let me get on the lift and come down and see you. I'll take you around. And, you know, this was all a shell here. You know? uh, and I'll give you a tour. He said, no. He said, you just keep doing what you're doing. He walked around the property for about 20 minutes. He got in his car and drove off. Well. I didn't know what he had in mind, but the doctors had told him he had cancer and he had X amount of time to live. And he was preparing his will. He was preparing his will. And he divided his will into something called a unitrust. I'm going to cut this off right here. 